Thanks for tuning in to Heartland Baptist Church in Ames, Iowa. We are a gospel preaching, Bible teaching ministry that does our very best to share God's great message of hope to all who will hear. We live stream our Sunday morning and evening services each week so that no matter where you are, you can hear great Christian music, practical life-changing sermons, and show honor to the God who made you, the Lord Jesus who loves you, and the Holy Spirit who wants to help you. Whether it's our Noah's Ark ministry for little kids, the Bible Land ministry for elementary, teen ministry, young adult ministry, young family ministry for parents with kids at home, adult ministries, and senior citizen ministry, we care about the whole family no matter what generation you're in. We love uplifting Christ-honoring music, lots of fellowship, special Sundays, holiday celebrations, church picnics, sports, BBS, outreach events, and of course, sound preaching and teaching from the scriptures. We actively seek to share how to be saved to the lost, offer fellowship to the lonely, help for the hurting, and hope for those who are struggling. If you live within driving distance, one of our pastors is happy to meet with you. But even if you don't, they're glad to chat on the phone or to email with you and offer biblical advice. And we don't just try to reach those in Central Iowa, but have an active missions program, supporting dozens of missionaries around the world, along with many ministries here in the States. If we can help you in any way, just let us know. And you are invited to visit sometime or join us online on a regular basis. We love you and know Jesus loves you that God has a wonderful purpose for your life. Here's our service.
the second verse. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so very much for another opportunity to be able to come into your house, sing your praises, and be reminded that it's not just us in Ames, Iowa that get to praise you. It's nations all across the globe, and we thank you for that, Father. Lord, we pray for our services tonight. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. All right, well, I pray that you, you may be seated. I pray that you've gotten to know the Comptons, and what a fantastic message this morning. And I don't think, I was talking with someone this afternoon, and they reminded us that we don't need to be a dum-dum, right? I mean, that's just going to stick with us for, for life. And so that's uh, just uh, thank you so much for that. If you're a guest with us this evening, if you would take a moment just to fill out the communication card that's in the seat pocket in front of you, that's our way to be able to connect with you. And if you have a prayer request, feel, feel free to fill out the back side of that card, and, we, and we'd be able to pray for you during our staff meetings and uh, pray with you during that time. And if you can't tell, we thoroughly enjoy missions. Uh, missions is just a great way uh, to, to see so many things, hear so many things about our missionaries. And if you enjoy the missions conference and as you're going along and thinking, how could I be more involved in missionaries? How could I hear more about missions and what's going on? Well, we have a missions team that meets once a month, and you are invited to be a part of that missions team. And what each of those missions members do is they have a missionary that we currently support, 
and they're assigned to stay with them, follow them, find out what their prayer needs are. And then at those monthly meetings, they present those needs or requests and updates to the team as a whole. And we get to pray over those missionaries. We get to find out what's going on. And it's a way to build that relationship and stay connected with our missionaries and know what's really going on. So when they have projects and we bring special projects to the church's attention, a lot of times those come from those meetings. And so if you'd like to be a part of that, to chat with me uh, or join one of the missions team that gets announced there in the bulletin. We'd love for you to be a part of that. Elmo and Kat, if you wouldn't mind just joining me here for a moment. And we as a missions team and a church uh, just want to thank you for your faithfulness to missions, your, the answering God's call to missions on your life, and we appreciate your time here with us. And we just want to give you a token of that appreciation for your time with us here from the church and from the missions team. And uh, again, thank you so much for sharing your heart for the people of Mexico. And I want to go to Tijuana. I'm ready to go tomorrow. So uh, you said Tuesday you're going back to work, so I might just jump on the plane with you. So, um, Well, this morning Kat spent some time in the children's ministry sharing uh, her heart there, and then uh, we asked them uh, tonight to share some stories. But now we've asked Kat if she would... To share your call to ministry. <laughs> well, hello, good evening. Wow, y'all are the first church that I it didn't have to do that again. Usually, I have to drag people out to actually talk and have a conversation. But um, my name's Kat. It's Catherine. But I mean, I'm married to an Elmo, and my son's name is Cinco. So Catherine's just way too formal. So I've just gone by Cat for all these years, and um, my call to ministry starts at my birth. And people are just like, what are you, what does that mean? Well, um, I am adopted, actually. Um, I'm a product of rape, and I was adopted into a Christian family. And not only a Christian family, but a pastor's family. So anytime and every time the doors were open in church, I was there whether I liked it or not. And so um, I led at a really young age. I led the children's choir. I did everything. I led a Sunday school class and all these different things. And my heart just definitely wasn't in it. As I hit my teenage years, I really struggled with being adopted. I struggled um, with what love meant. It was just a lot of things going on, obviously, with the normal teenage things. And so my dad decided, he's like, we got to get you out of the house. You're driving us crazy. Um, so they decided to send me to a camp on a mile-long, mile-wide island in the middle of nowhere of upstate New York. And for you guys, that might not seem like a big deal, okay, because you're kind of in the middle of nowhere here. Um, but I'm just going to put it into a little bit of perspective where I came from. Um, I grew up 11 miles from downtown Manhattan on the Jersey side, the good side, okay? And so for me, we were always surrounded by people. Now, God loves New Jersey most per square mile because we're the most densely populated state in the United States. But Anyway, I digress. So um, I went to this mile-long, mile-wide island in the middle of nowhere, and for the first time, I heard the gospel make sense to me. There was a speaker, and the speaker got up, and he said, don't base your faith on the fact that your parents have a relationship with Jesus Christ. And it really got my attention. And then he quoted three verses that radically changed my life. It's Romans 8, 37 through 39. The first one says, we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Okay, I'm a huge history person, and I also love to talk. So my goal in life was to be a tour guide. Could you see it? Can you see it, right? And so um, he, to what he did is he took this story, and he said, think about the author of this passage. He's saying that we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. And during this time, the Roman Empire was coming in, and they were conquering other nations. They weren't doing it peaceably. They were conquering other nations. And the author is saying that we are more than that because God loved us. Now, the next two verses, it lists all these things. It says, nor height, nor depth, nor angels, nor principalities, nor things present, nor things to come. And it lists all these things. But my favorite part is the last part of the verse. Because it's almost like, in case I missed anything, or in case you're going to make up any excuse, absolutely nothing can separate you from my love. Because you know what? As humans, that's what we do. We make up the excuses, oh, somebody couldn't love me because fill in the blank. 
Oh, I can't serve God because fill in the blank. We always make up this excuse. And because this author, I mean, because the speaker had gotten up and he had said those verses, it was almost like I understood that nothing could separate me from God's love. So at 16, beyond embarrassed, because here I am, a pastor's daughter, actually going forward and accepting Christ for the first time, it, it was really embarrassing for me. Because I had to go home and do everything that I had already done, but now I actually was doing it because God was in me. And so I came home from that camp, and my dad came to me, and he said, hey, you know that there's a missions trip going to Peru in a couple weeks? I said, yes. And he goes, you're going to go on that missions trip? And I said, um, no. And he's like, no, you're going to go on that missions trip. See, here's the deal. Corey, who was a guy in our youth group, he already raised his money. If you heard Alma's story this morning, he, he already raised his money. You have your passport. We already bought the ticket. You're going. And I said, Dad, you already made me take two weeks off of work. I don't know for camp. I don't know if I'm going to be able to get the time off. And he's like, well, if God's in it, your boss will give you the time off. So I went the next day into work. I worked at Starbucks. It was the 5 a.m. shift. So I waited for my boss to have several cups of coffee before I approached him. And for me, he, is, he's an, he was an awesome boss, and um, he was Jewish. And so I'm like, in my mind, how am I going to explain a mission trip? Like, you know, I, my mind's racing with all these things. So I went up to him and I said, good morning. And he said, when do you want off? I said, in two weeks. He said, for how long? And I said, two weeks. He goes, well, today I start vacation for two weeks, so I'll see you when you get back. And I was like, this mission trip is going to be awesome. Look what God just did. I got the time off. I didn't get fired. It's going to be great. And so I went on this mission trip to Peru, and everything and anything that could go wrong went wrong. We got shot at. Like, I'm not talking about, like, bows and arrows. I'm talking about, like, guns. Okay? We got stuck in the middle of the Amazon jungle for three extra days in about six feet of mud in our big bus. People that had walked, I was part of a medical missions team, people that had walked eight days were not going to be able to be seen because we were stuck. Like, there was no way that we were going to be able to get to them. And then when we finally get there, my job was to entertain the kids. I don't do kids. I told the kids this morning, kids make me nervous. And so I was just like, hi, I don't speak any of your language. I don't speak Spanish. Y'all don't speak Spanish. I don't know how we're going to get to this point here. Um, and so, and then the missionary came to me and he said, I want you to look out among, among, among these kids. And the funny thing is, is they had never seen a white person before because we're in the middle of nowhere. So every time I took a step this way, all 500 kids would step with me. Every time I took a step this way, all 500 kids would step this way. And so I could not go anywhere by myself the entire time we were there. And he said, look out on, among these kids. He said, if you came back here next year, probably two-thirds of them would be dead because they don't have clean water. I was really angry at God. Now, this is going to start a trend in my life where I got really angry at God for certain things. So I came, I went home from Peru. I went through this like phase where I didn't turn on my air conditioning and I couldn't do anything. Like I really wanted to live like I was in Peru, but I didn't want to go to Peru and I didn't want God to call me to Peru. And I was really glad other people were in Peru because I didn't want to go. How many of us have been there in our lives? I'm so glad somebody else is doing it because I don't want to do it. So I heard, I started school, um, my senior year of high school, and I heard the testimony of a missionary named Veronica Bowers. And Veronica Bowers, her and her husband, they had a houseboat. They would go up and down the Amazon River. People would get saved. They train national pastors, and they plant churches. And I was really excited because I didn't want to go. So I knew somebody else was there. And through her story, um, they were adopting a little girl. They were flying in from Colombia back into Peru, and they were on an airplane, not like a little Cessna airplane. Their radio wasn't working. The Peruvian government tried to contact them and couldn't get a hold of them, and they thought that they were a drug plane. So they opened fire on the airplane um, and killed both the, the, baby, the, the little girl and the mom. And I was once again angry at God. Because, see, here's the thing. I had these very honest conversations. I'm from Jersey, remember? So we have very honest conversations with people. And I'm like, God, why would you do that? There's not a line of people that are lining up to go to the deepest, darkest jungles of Peru. What are you doing? You have no idea what you're doing. How many of us have had that conversation with God? 
the author of the universe, we have the conversation that he has no idea what he's doing, right? And so I took out the, for some of you, you might not know what this is, but the testimony was on a VHS tape. So I took it out and I stuck it back on the shelf. And Easter rolled around and my dad had said to me, hey, why don't you go, some of our friends are planting a church, why don't you go on Good Friday and Easter and go help them in any way that you can? And I was like, sure, why not? Let's go. And so this, the pastor got up and he said, you know, the typical Good Friday thing, on Friday all was lost, but Sunday's a coming. And so I had heard it. He said it like eight times throughout the message. And God had just laid out my heart like her story is not over. You have to finish the tape. And I couldn't go to sleep that night. And the next day I got up and it was just on my mind. And I had, the, again, a conversation with God. God, she's not Jesus. She's not raising from the dead. Her story's over. And he was like, no, her story's not over. So I popped the tape back in, beauty of VHS back in the day, right? It was exactly where I had left it off. And it was people talking about this woman and the impact that she had made on their lives. And they said from the time that she was a little girl, she always knew that she wanted to be a missionary. And so she used to say, when I stand before God, I want him to say, well done, thou good and faithful servant, you've done it my way. Which is biblical. I heard that my entire life. But you know, the next part, she said, I just want to turn and look at God and say, God, it was worth it all. And finally, I was at a point that I was like, God, it will be worth it all. I will go. But you know what? I have conditions. See, I have a really strong personality. And I don't think I do good as a single missionary. Because people don't usually don't like women with strong personalities. I dated a guy all through high school. It was a super toxic relationship. He wanted nothing to do with God. And so I was like, you either need to change my heart, Lord, or you need to smack me in the face with the guy you want me to marry. That was my prayer. I was 17 years old. What do you want from me? And so I called. I was already scheduled to go to a secular school to become a tour guide. Like, that's what I was going. I was pursuing a degree in history. And so I decided to apply to a really small Bible college in Jacksonville, Florida. And so apparently they'll accept anybody because like two days before school, they said, come on down. And so I got in my car and I drove 26 hours um, down to Jacksonville, Florida. And my first day, I just met my roommate a couple hours before. She's like, what are you here for? I said, I want to be a missionary to Peru. You know, all the basic, like, chit-chat kind of thing. And she came in, and I, I had literally met her. I mean, our cars are still warm. Like, we had just gotten there. And she goes, hey, I met a guy. And I was like, girl, we just got here. If you know anything about Bible college, people say that you girls go to Bible college to find their husbands. And I literally looked at her, and I'm like, we just got here. And she goes, this guy would actually be perfect for you. And I said, I just met you. Thank you. I don't want you setting me up with anybody. And she goes, no, this guy introduces himself by the fact that he wants to be a missionary to Peru. And I said, well, that's stupid. I said, who wants to marry the man who wants to be the missionary to the deepest, darkest jungles of Peru, they want to marry the man who's going to be the pastor in Ames, Iowa, where there's heat and air conditioning. And then I kind of stopped in the middle. I'm like, wait a minute. I want to marry a missionary to Peru. So I went up right up to this guy in the little, like, quad area, and I knew who he was because he was the good-looking guy that the girls were walking away from. Because, again, who wants to marry a missionary to Peru, right? Right. And so I stuck my hand out and I said, hi, my name is Kat. He said, my name's Elmo. I want to be a, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Hi, my name's Elmo. I want to be a missionary to Peru. And so I said something very spiritual after that. Huh, me too. And so we went to very serious, very conservative, very strict Bible college that the only time you could touch was when you were shaking somebody's hand. So he did the, the Baptist Bible college handshake where he put both hands around my hand. And he goes, so are we going to do this thing or what? <laughs> now you see, you remember my prayer, right? Well, I still had said boyfriend. So I said, 
again, something super spiritual. Hold on one second. And I went into my dorm, and I picked up the phone, and guess what I did? I began to pray. God, please don't let him pick up the phone. Please let the answering machine answer. Please, 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 please. Because, see, the thing is, is I talk fast because I don't like to waste people's time. And in my mind, if I was going to break up with my boyfriend that I had been with for four years, I was going to say to myself that I wasted his time. And I knew that if he picked up that phone, that he was going to talk me out of it. So sure enough, voicemail answers. And my conversation went a little something like this. Hey, it's me. Remember that prayer that I had with God? Well, guess what? I just met the guy that I'm going to marry. It's not you. I'm really sorry that I wasted your time. I hope that you have a great life. And I hung up the phone. And I walked outside. And the missionary to Peru was still standing there. <laughs> yeah. That was 17 years ago. We've been married for 15 years. We have two beautiful kids. And it, it sounds like it's a joke, and it sounds like it's funny, and it sounds like it's made up, and it's not. It's 100% real. But you know what? That's the great thing about our God, because he takes things that we need and puts it into our life the way that we need them. I love to be funny. And God used something so comical to bring us together to serve him. We've been pursuing Peru that it, we pursued Peru that entire time. And when God said, you know what, Peru might not be where you're going to spend the rest of your life, we were able to change and walk and move from Peru to Mexico because we realized that it didn't matter the location because God's call is not locational. God's call only matters if we follow where he leads us. And so for us, we have such an honor and a privilege to serve others. God has given me a voice to be able to speak to girls that have been in the same situation as me. Girls who were, are either products of rape or have, um, have been through that th themselves. I've been able to speak at the Right for Life all over the United States and even all over the world. And God has just used his story in our lives in such an incredible way. And I just want to say thank you. Thank you for listening to me. Thank you for listening to my family. Thank you for listening to our story. Um, our son is here, Elmo Cinco. That's Cinco. He's 10 years old. We prayed for five years that God would bless us with a child. We were told that we had less than a 2% chance of ever conceiving naturally, and he's miracle number one. And then after eight years of trying and waiting, God blessed us with miracle number two, who is Hadley Grace. She's three months old. She's in the nursery. And so God has just blessed our family over and above, not only serving him, but also our family family, like the Comptons as a family. So thank you so much. Um, and we can't wait to share more with you. Well, this last song we're going to sing tonight is called All to Us. And it's all about the passion that we should have for our Savior and the passion that we should have in our church. Uh, we're going to sing the first verse for you, and then you can join us as we repeat. Away 
touched the thing earlier and jacked up your words. Sorry about that. <laughs> All right. Well, so this is one of my favorite parts of, of uh, hanging out with churches. Uh, we get to talk about the big picture. 30,000 foot, why we give to missions, why we do all this. But right now we're going to be looking at some of the faces and some of the stories. There's no way in the time that I have that I can give you a comprehensive overview of everything. So we're going to zoom in and really get into the micro for the next couple minutes. Okay, you guys with me? You guys have your coffee before you came? I won't keep you too late. Okay, so this first picture, uh, we went to Peru uh, with, the, with the plan, as we've said all day, uh, to plant local churches. So we began... Uh, a, a process. We moved into a new community, uh, and we didn't know anybody. We didn't know where to go grocery shopping. We didn't know how to do anything, because the first two years we'd spent working with a, a, a one local church, and we moved into a new neighborhood across town. And uh, we did one year of pre-launch services, where basically there were Bible studies in our house, and I would meet guys at the supermarket, or at the gym, or like at the places, and just out. And then though I would invite them to our house, and we did stuff in our house, and then uh, at our one-year anniversary, this was our one-year anniversary of the church we planted that was called Iglesia Mosaico, uh, and that was in a hotel that was in our conference room, and it was that room, and then it was a room that was behind where those blue balloons are, uh, where the kids hung out, and that was, we occupied the entire top floor of this little hotel, uh, and that was, we had about, what, 110 folks there on that first, uh, that anniversary Sunday, uh, and some of those little people you see up front were people that I was even able to baptize later, and our first baptism <clears throat> was a little scary. How many of you have ever been to the Pacific Ocean before? So the Pacific Ocean uh, is not like other oceans. It's got some pretty strong waves. Um, so our baptism was a little scary. <laughs> um, our baptism was uh, our first baptism. It was an Easter after our first year anniversary, uh, and I was able to baptize six uh, of our young adults um, in our church. Um, three of them almost died. I almost died. It was pretty intense. Um, that young girl who's under the water uh, belongs to the, her dad is the guy standing there to the left. And, um, and yeah, that was a pretty scary moment in all of our lives um, there for a moment. Uh, That's why you don't weigh 90 pounds. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Eat more and you don't die when you're baptized. <laughs> Uh, as our church grew, we, we grew into this. Kat's going to talk about this group of folks. Yeah, so this is our group of volunteers. Uh, we, right after our first anniversary, we were so excited because our church had grown to 110 people in one year. And um, the week after our anniversary, we found out that the hotel that we were meeting in, which, who gave us a great deal, um, decided that they were going to close their doors. And so that meant that we had no home. And so we went, um, you saw in the baptism video that was at the beach. Well, we had church there on the beach, and we had church in the park, and we had church wherever, you know, 60 people could join. And we pretty much just staked out an area, sent out a text message and said, hey, in 45 minutes, we're going to be here, and here's the location. And so um, after months of praying together as a um, church family, God blessed us with a building. And so that is taken in the top floor. And that is our group of volunteers that served at our opening Sunday. And so God, um, our, the number of our people from the first anniversary had gotten smaller and smaller and smaller because we didn't have a, we didn't have a place to meet. It was such a church on the move. And it was kind of discouraging during that moment. Well, God said, watch this. And uh, there were 110 people on our opening day. And so God just said, I, I got you, and it's not the same 110 people that we had before. So you're going to get 110 new people. And so this is our, the people that serve in our church. Um, some of these we've been able to um, marry. Some of these people we've been able to dedicate their children and to walk alongside uh, for the past five years. And so we just love each and every one of these people. And there's Cinco in the flesh shirt in the front when he was super <laughs> tiny. <laughs> uh, one of the main areas of ministry that I, uh, that I enjoyed uh, during my time in Peru and that I still enjoy now, uh, the gentleman that you see there uh, to the left, the guy was doing the thumbs up, his name is Christian Rosas. He's a, a, a political consultant that works throughout Latin America. Um, that's the gentleman in the middle is my best friend who was our business manager at the time. Uh, and we had just finished speaking in front of a crowd that was numbered just under a million folks. It was like 900 and something thousand people that filled every plaza downtown Lima. Um, and do we even have a, yeah. So he invited me to come and to speak, well, he invited me to come and be with him 
in this March for Life, this Right for Life rally that was happening downtown Lima. And he said, it's going to be kind of a big deal, uh, but he totally downplayed it. Um, and then I called him the night before uh, to pray with him, and um, he said, hey, well, what time are you meeting me tomorrow? You're, you're coming tomorrow, right? And I was like, dude, I wasn't invited. I wasn't planning on joining you physically. I'm going to be with you in spirit, but it's going to be a little bit hectic for me to be there. He said, no, you need to come. You've got to come. So uh, I want your whole family to be there. So okay, no problem. So I get my wife and my son, and we go. Uh, and I'm on stage with 40 or 50 other uh, dignitaries. They were pastors from large churches, congressmen, governors, mayors, different people, all advocating for life. And he turns to me, uh, and he says, Elmo, you're up after that congressman. And I was like, wait, what? I totally didn't plan to speak in front of camera crews and all of downtown Lima gridlocked because of this thing. Uh, And that was me ad-libbing five minutes uh, talking about how God loves the family. So I brought my son up and I called everybody lazy and I said, if you don't pick up the torch, my son's going to do it. If you morons won't continue to fight for life. My son one day will show you how it's done. And that was my, that was my ad lib. That was what I did. Um, and um, yeah, so that, that was a ministry that um, unfortunately due to COVID, all of those contexts that we had, all the contexts that were in our group, um, there was a, a political coup that happened uh, and all of those contexts um, left Peru. Uh, it became dangerous for that group, uh, that political party. And uh, and so that group of people that I ministered to is now all over Latin America. A lot of them are actually in Miami, which is interesting. Um, but, so yeah. <clears throat> so these are, my, these are my three best friends. And um, I was telling t- earlier, being a missionary is hard because sometimes you feel like you're all by yourself. And so when I went to the mission field, I prayed very hard that God would bless me with some friends. Friends that I could do life and ministry alongside because when you do ministry alone, it's usually not successful. And so God blessed me with these three women. Um, right next to me is Jordan. And the cool thing about this is Jordan and her husband, then when they first came to our church, they, um, they were not in a good place. Well, they weren't married. They weren't married, and they were living together. And there was just a bunch of issues within that. And um, we got to work and do all their premarital con- counseling. We got to marry them. They have a little girl now. Um, and Jordan right now is residing in Denver, Colorado. And so um, it's really cool because not only you guys, I'm going to let you know, these four, us four are no longer in Peru, but we were there when we needed each other the most. And so God just, again, he blesses in such incredible ways. And not only that, but all four of us serve in completely different capacities now, um, but we are able to still remain friends and still serve God and the gospel is being further, furthered in other places. Next to her is Carol. Carol is incredible in the fact that she is a go-getter. She'll do anything you want. Um, She was actually on staff at our church in Peru, and she did all of the kids stuff because I don't do kids. And so we were super thankful when Carol came and joined us, and she is actually the first missionary sent out of our church in Peru. Because see, the thing is, is when you support missionaries, it doesn't, it shouldn't just stop at us. We should continue to be sending missionaries out, and Carol is our first missionary. And so she is going to the jungle of Peru from the city, and she's marrying an awesome Christian guy, and uh, they will be heading to Mexico with us um, in probably next year to receive more training and to train underneath us in Mexico and then go back to Peru. And so we're super excited to see her again. She's getting married in three weeks, and so we're really excited to see what, what God's going to do through Carol. And then Jess, if you, know, if you remember the picture of the three guys, the guy in the middle next to Elmo, oh, we can, can, we can move this. back. That. that guy. The guy in the middle, his name is Edwin. Well, married that chick. Yes, that's Jess. <laughs> And we were kindred spirits, and we hit it off right from the get-go because she's from Jersey, too. And she was a, ch- she was a teacher in, at Cinco's school at the International Christian School of Lima. And they are back in New Jersey, and they're serving at their church, and he's a deacon, and they're just really flourishing. And so um, God just gives us these extra things, and he gives us great friends. And those people, you know those people. Uh, and I hope you know the people by now. Um, and God has just incredibly blessed our family. And as we were transitioning from a ministry that was focused to Latin Amer- South America to a ministry that was focused, uh, based out of, uh, out of Mexico, 
Uh, God gave us uh, our beautiful daughter. Her name is Hadley. If you've not met Hadley, you should stop by and see her on the way out. Uh, she's half Mexican, which is really cool, uh, how that's a neat segue onto to Mexican ministry for us and our family. This is an aerial shot of the border between Tijuana and Southern California. So uh, obviously what you see to your right is Tijuana, uh, and what you see to your left is San Diego. And that that avenue and that wall that you see right there is the, the border. And I, I've talked to several folks here who lived in California. You understand the dynamic. As soon as you cross through that border checkpoint, then you begin to smell uh, feces and urine, and you begin to, you, you have totally left a developed country and you've entered into a developing country. Uh, and it is, there are nice places, some nice places. Um, but for the most part, poverty is what reigns in, in the city of, 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 of Tijuana. Um, we've begun working with a local church. I explained that in a couple different times. So we're working with a local church, and I was asked to lead up their young adults, um, their like senior high and college age kid group. Um, and so I'm, <laughs> I haven't been a youth pastor in a long time. Same hats off, man. It's a lot of work. Um, the, and the ages that you work with, it's a ton of work. Um, and... I've done that in a long time. I've been more um, focused on a professional demographic for a long time, but I said, sure, I will do it. Uh, I think that I can find the energy to do it. And I was given uh, a group of just a handful of kids. Uh, and that group right there, I think that there's 18 or 19 in that group, plus all my leaders were off to the side. Um, some people who have stepped in to help me volunteer. And that was just last Saturday, uh, a group of young people that, we, that I'm ministering to. I'm actually going through uh, a series teaching them about the church, just the fundamentals of what church is, uh, what the church, just talking about going through Acts, talking about what church is supposed to be. I said, you guys are the future of this local congregation. I want to make sure that you're grounded in what church is supposed to be. It's actually, I'm practicing with them before I do it with the church. That's the whole idea. And we're going to rehash it uh, in two months with, uh, with the church. We hosted our, oh, you're going to do this one. That's right. <laughs> So if you, I mean, you've heard both of our stories, and so we are products, we are missionaries because of short-term short -term missions trips. So this is a plug for any missions trip that your church ever goes on. If you cannot go, you give some money for those people to go because it can change their lives, and we are, we, we are proof of that. And so we had a team. We told the missions committee we had three days that we heard that we were planning this team. And so this is a team from Arkansas that came down, and um, they were able to go into a community. And see, the, the, thing about, the thing about missions trips is I can do everything a missions trip does without the missions trip. But I can't necessarily get into the places that I can with a, without a bunch of white people. And so the, we use uh, missions trips to get into areas that we wouldn't normally be able to get into. And so this is just proof of that. Uh, and so the, this church that we're, that we're working with, you guys are familiar with MANA, right? So this church uh, hosts uh, a MANA feeding center. So we feed between 65 and 75 right now. And the goal is to get to about 100. Uh, we have capacity for 100 kids that come from some of the most poorest places in Tijuana. Uh, and so this is uh, our group of kids that are at the Manna Fitting Center, and that was their Christmas activity. Uh, and this couple here uh, are some of our new friends. This couple, uh, his name is Lalo. Um, some people call him Frio, Briones. Uh, and he was, um, he's, has an incredible testimony, an incredible story. Um, Lalo was um, caught up in the drug culture that permeates Tijuana. Uh, he was an addict so bad that his family checked him into a mental health institution. I believe, and he believes, that there was possession, spirit, demon possession that happened in his life. Uh, four years, five years ago, rather, he got saved, uh, and God has completely healed him from all of uh, the trauma that he went through and all of this, the consequences of the sin in his life. Four years ago, he met this beautiful young lady. Her name is Wendy. Um, she is like bubbly and awesome and incredible personality. Um, Lalo's becoming one of my, one of my new best friends. Uh, and they are in charge of all the social media and all of the, the, the pictures and videos that the church does on a, on a volunteer basis. They own a very successful um, photography business that he started. Uh, and the gentleman, you can't really tell in that picture, um, but he is covered in tattoos from his eye, top of his head all the way down, I guess, his feet. I've never seen his feet, but onto his feet. And, and it tells a story of where he's been 
uh, and he uses that to advance the gospel. And people say, oh, I recognize that, that specific cartel tattoo. He says, yeah, I used to run with those guys. Let me tell you who I run with now. And walks them through, and it's incredible because he has no fear. He has no filter. Um, and sometimes it gets us in trouble, but I definitely can relate to a guy that has no fear and has no filter. So because he's married to me. Right. <laughs> so they have becoming um, part. They intro- Lalo and, and Wendy introduced us to this specific neighborhood. This neighborhood is called Nueva Esperanza, which means New Hope, which is very interesting because that was also the name of one of the neighborhoods we worked in in Lima that was called Nueva Esperanza. Um, so I actually just found that out like four days ago. <laughs> It doesn't look very hopeful, doesn't it? Does it? It's, it's cardboard shacks. And um, we have been able to go into this community. And Lalo and Wendy, um, when Lalo was going through some of his mental health issues, this is where he lived. And so he knows these people and he knows their families. And so he has an in with this group of people. And God has just been able to bless us. We're going here on March 18th um, to be able to... Just love I'm just on some scroll people. Some of these cool pictures. Yeah, here are some of the people, <laughs> the kids that live there. Um, it's really not much to look at, but you know what? The great thing is, is we can go in and say, "Well, you might think not think that you have new hope. We have new hope that we can share with you." And so, and that's Jesus Christ. And so, that's Lalo right there. <laughs> that's him. And you know, God, again, God does some pretty incredible, crazy things. He has horns tattooed on his head. Okay. <laughs> And God has just taken him from a life, again, that he was running with people that he shouldn't be to running with God. And we just are honored that we get to serve alongside him and do ministry alongside him. What Lalo doesn't know yet is that he's going to be a pastor. He doesn't know that yet. (laughs) Um, And I think if I told him that now, I think it would scare the bejesus out of him. But I see it in him, and I'm definitely not a prophet, but... I'm pretty sure that that's what God's got for him because I see him leading, I see him loving, and I see him studying, and I see him just loving the church and how the church gave him hope. Uh, I remember, church, I told you this morning that Jesus was the what? The hope of the world. And Jesus is the hope for guys like Lalo and the stories that he's come from, and he's going to be instrumental in our ministry's success in TJ, uh, partnering with men and women just like, just like him. One of the interesting yeah, we, we wholeheartedly believe that we should not give hand ups, but we get, I mean, not give handouts, but we give hand ups. And so a lot of these kids, they think that this is the end. They think that they're going to be born into this lifestyle, be this. raised in this lifestyle, and then they're going to die in this lifestyle and live in this community. And that's not the case. We want to be able to offer something to them that will further them who they are, not only spiritually, but also um, in their jobs and physically and all that. So God has blessed us with what looks like a group of kids, but this is a super important group of kids because yeah. this is our robotics team. This is actually the first church-run robotics team in all of Mexico and one of the first STEM, STEM programs that um, Elmo's going to share about. Yeah, so I had an opportunity uh, as soon as we got into town almost the first week, uh, someone invited me to, to participate in a STEM-based robotics program in my son's school in San Diego, where he's going to school and right across the border. Um, and I was like, <laughs> you know, I studied, right? <laughs> like, I'm not an engineer. Um, I, if I was an engineer, I'd be making a lot more money than I make right now. Um, and I work in the church. I've studied theology. I've studied leadership. I've studied, you know, not, not robotics. <laughs> and he was like, no, we actually need a chaplain because we want, we, 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 we want to leverage this to reach people in Mexico uh, but we don't have anybody who's bilingual. We don't have anybody who, who can advise us on the spiritual side. Would you be interested? <laughs> I was like, yeah, <laughs> that'd be cool. Uh, so I go twice a week, uh, and we spend six hours, three hours each, uh, Monday and Wednesday. Uh, I'm going to miss tomorrow because I'm here with you guys, so you have to send your apologies to my team because I won't be there with them tomorrow. Um, but, uh, and then what I'm learning in, at, at Ocean View Christian Academy, what I'm learning there is I'm take, uh, and then I'm taking it and instructing uh, a group of kids in, in TJ. And why is this important? Obviously, I'm not about teaching kids how to build robots, right? I, I'm about building long-term relationships with people so I can explain and live out the gospel message with them, alongside them. I'm about 
doing discipleship. Because this morning, first thing, we read Matthew chapter 28, and he said, go teach, baptize, make disciples, right? So making disciples requires a lot of face time. And sometimes people who are not church folk need a pretext to come to church, and this is a phenomenal pretext. What this does is it invites people who are not normally church people to come onto the property and to spend time with me, and then that transitions phenomenally into a gospel conversation. So that's the reason that our youth group, don't interrupt me. Okay. Our, okay. So actually, the girl in the green, um, right there in that, in that picture, the cool thing about the robotics program is not only is it attracting people to Mexico, but that girl, she lives in Tijuana, mm-hmm. but she is a student at Ocean View Christian Academy. And at Ocean View in San Diego, they do not require that you have to be a believer to attend. And so we get to minister on both sides here because this girl comes every week to be able to, she doesn't know it yet, but she's serving God. She's, she's doing what she feels called to do with her life, to be an engineer, and she's serving others. And so we're already starting her pre-salvation to serve <laughs> others. So that's a good place to be she's at. She's a pre-believer. Yes. <laughs> she's a pre-believer. And here. So she does. Yeah. There they are. Yeah. And so we were in that, that was our second week and we're just completing our fifth week. Uh, we've got We've got three full competition-built robots, Lego robots now. We're going to start competitions, and we've gone from kids who didn't know how to turn on a computer, and now they're building simple codes and, and, and working in the programs, and we've advanced quickly. The kids are doing great homework, and that has been one of the main reasons that our youth group has grown, because they come for robotics, and, and I strategically place youth group right after that. So that's, they already came, so why don't you just stay? It's going to be great. Um, and so what did I have? I had nothing. Awesome. Okay, so... Um, again, when we go through and look for specific stories and faces, um, it's impossible for me to utilize the time I have with you right now and, and cover even a minuscule amount of them. You know the best way to see the people that I minister to? Come visit me. So I'm going to go ahead and just say this. If the Guatemala thing doesn't happen, call me, okay? We can plan because a mission trip in three days. I can do it in three days. <laughs> <laughs> I know that you're going to do a man feeding center, Guatemala trip. I have a man feeding center in TJ. If Guatemala doesn't work out, we'll connect with whoever you lays on with man and we'll make it happen in TJ. If that doesn't work and you want to just come visit me, you've got my card. If you don't have my card, pick one up on the way out. Our, our email is pretty simple. Um, we have places to host you. Um, we have vehicles to get you from San Diego. Uh, and I know the best taco joints in town. So it'll be a lot of fun. Um, in, in that as well, um, we are super easy to con. Yeah. In San in Diego. San Diego? Yeah. I was like, the whole city is a zoo in TJ. <laughs> <laughs> um, when, it, when it comes to serving God and serving him on the, like, the foreign mission field, the best is to get along, roll up your sleeves, get your hands dirty, and serve alongside somebody else. But if you have any other questions, if, you're not, if you can't come to Culver's with us and you can't get a hold of us, um, we are the easiest people to get in contact with. Because what's my name? Cat. Cat with a K. With a K. What's his name? <laughs> Elmo. So elmoandcat.com. Super easy, right? And it's all spelled out, Elmo and Cat. And that's our email. You can contact us directly through there. And so anytime, if you have any questions that you'd like to reach out to us or any comments or anything, we would love to hear from you. And um, we would love to show you and do this journey alongside you, along, along, alongside your church, um, but also have you witness it firsthand. Yeah, so I was going to close it with this. Um, I, I, I said this morning... Uh, one of my favorite taglines. Don't be a dumb dumb with your dumb dumbs, right? Here's another one that a good friend of mine who's a pastor says all the time. Go on a missions trip. It'll change your life. If you've not gone on one, go. Explore. Learn. It help ex- expound your worldview. I know that right now is a scary time to travel. But remember, church, we don't live by fear. We live by faith. Remember, right? So go on a missions trip. It'll change your life. Lord, for the people in Peru that have been impacted by the gospel. Lord, I thank you for the people in Mexico 
that are already hearing the gospel message. Or we continue to pray for those in Mexico that are going to hear the gospel. Or we pray that those people respond and that one day we'll be able to see them face to face in heaven. And Lord, we love you so much. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. If you can, uh, join the Comptons and Stephen Crane, uh, the official youth pastor, um, at uh, Culver's, all right? And you guys have a great week, and God bless. We'll see you for our missions conference. We do have Wednesday nights. Uh, we'll start resuming those, and that'll be this Wednesday. You'll have three options to choose from, so come Wednesday night as well.